Hello everyone, my name is Darla Saunders and on behalf of the Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation and the Canadian Rivers Institute, I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar. The series is made possible in part thanks to the contributions of the Government of Canada. We're delighted today to be welcoming Dr. Tommy Lenansari and Yanni Helmanen of the Canadian Rivers Institute and the University of New Brunswick. Dr. Tommy Lenansari is an associate professor at the Canadian Rivers Institute, Department of Biology, and Faculty of Forestry and Environmental Management, University of New Brunswick. He did his undergraduate and Master's of Science degrees at the University of Helsinki and received his PhD from UNB. Dr. Lenansari is a fish ecologist and he is currently a research coordinator for Collaboration for Atlantic Salmon Tomorrow, or CAST, Research Consortium, and the CAST Atlantic Salmon Research Chair at UNB, where he supervises undergraduate and graduate students, postdocs, and staff. Yanni Helmanen is a PhD candidate at the University of New Brunswick. He is supervised by Dr. Lennon Sari and, like him, completed his undergraduate and Master's of Science degrees at the University of Helsinki in Aquatic Sciences with a focus on fish, and fisheries biology. After working in various environmental consulting projects and finishing his master's degree, he started to work in CAS sonar project in 2016. His focus is to improve technology for a better understanding of fish behavior and fish population size assessment. After the presentation, we'll be opening the floor for a question and answer session. You'll have the option of asking your questions directly using your microphone, or you can type them in and we'll read them aloud. I will now turn the webinar over to Tommy and Yanni. Thank you, Darla, and thank you for the kind introduction. Um, and thanks for everybody for uh, tuning in to listen to uh, our presentation. Um, I'm Tommy, and I'm, I'm just only going to give a very brief introduction this, more, uh, this afternoon to, to the uh, collaboration for Atlantic Salmon Tomorrow Research Consortium. I will not uh, hog too much of your time because everybody has tuned in to listen to the uh, the more interesting part, which is the uh, the actual um, sonar business. And Yanni will, uh, as an expert on on that field, he will be uh, he'll be entertaining you for the most of this uh, webinar. But I, I thought it's uh, I'll take the opportunity to very briefly introduce what our CAS project is. We've been um, starting a, a few uh, research projects um, in the last couple of years and we're going to be uh, continuing for, for a time being. So so I'm, I will give you a little bit of uh, introduction what CAST is and what we're doing. Um, now if my computer will actually work. Um, why did we start uh, a new research consortium um, in New Brunswick? Well, um, as many of the people who are familiar with the, uh, the salmon situation here in, uh, in the maritime provinces, um, things um, for salmon has, have not been particularly great as of late. Um, Many of us still remember the 2014 year, which across many rivers was really um, the lowest returns on, on many of the rivers, index rivers that, for example, DFO is monitoring. And it's fair to say that the 2014 was a year that really, as I say, uh, broke the camel's back. Um, 2000 year, when the low returns came, um, the federal government also uh, put together uh, from Ottawa, this uh, DFO's ministerial advisory committee, who toured around the uh, the different maritime provinces, and basically seeking people's opinions and advice, what what should be the way forward. Now, the low returns were particularly um, bad in the Northwest Miramichi River. I have in the upper right hand corner here. I borrowed a graph from the latest. Uh, DFO's uh, salmon assessment data sh just showing you how the numbers um, in DFO data set has evolved. So um, number, numbers of returning salmon here on the left hand side for, for multi-sea winter salmon and for the grilled component and um, numbers are down comparative to the uh, long-term 
or, or the the average uh, trend that DFO has has plotted on this line. So so that was a part of a trigger that there was a group of people who said, well, maybe we'll have to try to do something. The group came together to really present um, advice and an opinion for um, for forward going action for this said DFO's ministerial advisory committee. Uh, and the meeting in New Brunswick was in March 23rd, 2015. Well, that committee moved, moved, uh, moved on, went to Ottawa to deliberate for the next steps. But that group who, who came together to uh, give advice, we thought that there was a, a lot of positive synergy with the group who we had together. And we said, well, wait a minute, we have a good group of people here together, we have a number of good ideas. Why don't we just start working on some of these projects? And that group became then later known as the, the collaboration for Adeline and Salmon Tomorrow or CAST. Who's involved in CAST? Of course, we have a number of partners. Uh, it's a rather, rather large consortium. So we have funding partners. We have certain industries who are providing a number of logistics and funding and working in partnership with us. And then we have science providers. A lot of the science and CAST is being uh, undertaken by the Canadian River Institute here at UMB. Um, we have some signature project that the Miramichi Seminole Association is involved. And we have genetic um, professionals involved in our group from the University Laval. Um, funding is coming from a number of um, different sources. ACOA, province of New Brunswick, uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada are, are large contributors alongside with the JD Irving and Cook Aquaculture, um, so who are the industrial partners in the, uh, in the consortium. Some funding is also coming from Atlantic Salmon Conservation Foundation, and for certain certain parts, we are also uh, having funding from the New Brunswick Innovation Foundation. Um, so I work at the UMB. So again, CAST is very much a team effort, and I'm just focusing just to show you an example of how much uh, work we are doing here at UMB. This is uh, the field team we had uh, just for last summer. Uh, we had 25 team members working on various CAS tasks and, and it's fair, fair to say that we're just getting started in a number of projects. Uh, what is the best part for me as a associate professor here at UMB is that I get to work with young, um, innovative minds, fresh minds and the smartest people um, who who are all care about salmon and uh, the enthusiasm is is really uh, what what keeps me going on a daily basis when when times get busy. These young minds and the education for them um, are providing a number of opportunities uh, for for a great number of people, and and that's one of the fantastic parts. Um, so if you guys see uh, any of our cast members out in the field and going forward. Stop them to say hi, and uh, they will be happy to uh, talk to you about CAST projects. When is CAST happening? CAST is a phase approach. A phase approach, we are now in our phase one. It's a five-year project. Some of the CAST projects, I'm going to briefly mention our project in the next slide. Uh, some of our CAST projects have already started, like Yanni's um, sonar assessment. Some projects we're still waiting for. Um, we're still uh, figuring out and, and uh, preparing for some meetings in, with regard to certain projects of the cast, but we're hoping to, to get a, a whole number of new projects started uh, as early as next summer. Some of our proposed projects will uh, need a monitoring period, period of at least 15 years. So CAST is gonna be around for, for a long term and we're looking forward for starting new projects uh, also in the future. So what are some of our signature projects in the in the phase one? Um, I'm, I'm talking, I'm briefly mentioning three of the largest ones uh, right now. One of our projects is looking at um, landscape effects and landscape effects on uh, river temperature and what uh, aspects are regulating temperature and we're focusing uh, in the Miramichi River. We have a PhD candidate, Antonio Sullivan, who is uh, spearheading that project. Second project is this uh, population assessment that, that Yanni is going to focus for the rest of this presentation. So I'm not gonna 
spend more time on that. A third larger project is um, we have been proposing an adult supplementation project to, to find out um, how a relatively novel conservation strategy may, uh, may work in population recovery. Here, uh, the Miramichi Salmon Association is, is a heavy lifter um, who are working working on the adult supplementation project. And we at UMB Canadian Rivers Institute um, will be the scientific monitor uh, of the outcome of the project. And we have a number of uh, graduate students and postdocs who are working on that project. I will be now turning uh, over to Yanni to talk more about the population, salmon assess uh, population assessment. Before I do so, if, um, if people want to learn more about CAST or get in, in touch with us and a hold of us, we have a Facebook site, we have websites. Uh, Yanis Aries counts are on a separate website, phone, email. We'll be happy to answer uh, any questions uh, people might have on, on any of our projects. I'll now be turning over to Yanni, who will start to uh, talk more about the Sonar project. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you, Tommy. Thank you, Darla. Thanks, everybody, for joining us today. Um, as it's probably already clear for everybody, we're going to be talking about sonars and uh, Atlantic salmon monitoring. Um, actually, I'm going to turn that off. I'm going to go through seven different chapters or points. Um, first one, first one will be about monitoring salmon populations overall. Why would we do that, and and how how it's usually done? Second, I'm gonna talk a little bit about sonars, and then about imaging sonars. That's in the in the topic as well. Um, fourth will be about how do we process the the data that we're collecting with the sonars. Uh, and then I'll present what we have been doing, our, our study sites, and uh, what we learned when we were starting. Probably most of you will not be, ever be starting a project like this, but maybe some will. And uh, it's, it's good, good to see anyways what we are going through before we actually get the data and the results that are later used for different different whatever they're going to be used for so let's start with the monitoring part and uh, the why part so why why would we need to know the number of fish that are returning to the rivers um, one big thing for sure is the the conservation part um, salmon is a very iconic species and, and we're all here following um, a webinar about salmon. So the, the species itself is, is worth um, no, knowing how many we already have. Are we going maybe getting more salmon or maybe getting less each year? Another big thing is people, we, we like to, to fish for salmon. And in order to do, to do so, uh, we should really know how many salmon we have because uh, otherwise, we might be fishing a stock that really cannot sustain the, the fishing pressure. Or other way around, maybe we have a lot of salmon and, and there could be a chance to take take some of them home even. And then for environmental impact assessment purposes, um, of course, it, it's really good to have some base numbers already. Let's say something happened in the river or somewhere nearby, if we have base numbers about how many salmons we, we, we have we have had have had or what we maybe should have in the future we can then compare if there was an impact from from something that happened be it uh, something was built nearby or maybe the climate change for example so how this is done um, this is one very typical method is to cover the whole river with uh, with a fence. So this is so-called counting fence. And uh, 
the fish won't won't be able to pass. They're coming this way from from downstream and up, and they won't be able to pass this fence any other way except going to the box, where the fish can be then measured and counted, and then later released upstream, and then they can keep going. That way, we'll really know the exact number of fish, how many we we had each year. Of course, one one problem is when it when we get big floods, for example, then the water will go, for example, around the fence or or even over the fence, and then the counts will not be as accurate. Another way to count fish or even use can, this, can, can, this can also be used with the fence is to tag some of the some of the fish, and then based on the number of fish we we tag and later caught. Um, we can make assessment of how many how many fish we have in the river this year. So, of course, if you have, have to handle the fish, that can have negative in impacts for the the fish itself. But but the good thing with this method is is we're really getting individual fish data, especially when these fish are caught again. There is a number that identifies the fish, and and when it's caught again, we'll we'll know what it did. Maybe it even, maybe well, not in the case of salmon, but but like if if you're catching it years after, uh, also in the case of salmon, if you're catching it years after, we'll we'll see how much it grew up during those years. Also, there's a long history with these methods, so that that that's another reason why these are good methods to keep keep doing, because uh, we we already know the data that we're supposed to get. I put the last part is plus and minus. So this requires a lot of work, a lot of people, which can be a good thing because then we have jobs and, and it, it's also fun. But of course, it, it then takes a lot of money as well. Otherwise, we can use uh, video cameras to count fish. So we can have normal normal cameras in the water. And that way, we can actually very easily tell what species we had, and and we can count them. We can even measure them, um, especially if we set up the study site very well. The only issue is is there's light needed, so um, it, it won't work in in turbid waters, for example. So really, really need is is clear water, and and also at night there is a problem. So even even setting up lights. Can be an issue in in a bigger river. Um, this is actually actual footage from our our studies, and uh, I I have no experience how difficult it is to set lights in the in the big river. They often get flushed out, and 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 uh, they're often not powerful enough. Another way uh, is an infrared fish counter. Um, usually, we talk about Vaki River Watcher fish counters. It's a device that the fish swims through. There is infrared plates, and when fish or something else goes through, it'll it'll record the fish. So here is a actual footage, and the outcome will look like this. It'll draw a silhouette silhouette about the fish, and that way we'll get the the length. And uh, if we have a video camera there as well. We'll, we'll get the species. There are usually most used, or but yeah, usually usually used, and maybe the best best way to use them is in in, in fish ways, where the fish are going through tight space anyway, so it doesn't matter for them to go through this kind of tunnel as well. Uh, or they can be also used in in actual rivers, but then usually we would need more of them in the river, so fish would have plenty of options to go and swim upstream and downstream. So now we will finally get to the sonar part, which is today's topic. Um, what is so uh, sonar? It's about sound. So I mentioned earlier that video cameras need light. Um, sonar needs sound and it uses sound to, to work, detect objects in the water. So how it works, it, it, it's, it sends sound, and, and based on the echoes that it's getting back, back, it will create digital images for us. So this is now the second part. 
Um, many of you will probably recognize this device. It's a fish finder. Um, can be used for, uh, well, usually used for finding fish in the in the waters. And uh, actually, this image is from from my master's study. I was using it for for mapping mapping rivers. Um, Sonar, because it uses sound, it works in dark and turbid waters and doesn't need light. And it can work in, in very long ranges. So even deep, deep oceans can be mapped with, with the sonar device. Um, and this is how it works. There's the, the person sending, or, or he's or her uh, sonar is sending sound and it's getting two, two pings back. So first, first echo will be coming from the, the fish that's, that's in the middle of the water. And then the second echo will be coming up from the bottom. Um, the idea is this, um, the speaker will, or the transducer will send sound. And when there's an object, the sound will bounce back. So for example, this fish here is half a second away from, from the speaker and another half second will be taking so it reaches back to the microphone when it's recorded. This fish is one second away from, from the microphone and, and the speaker. And if we know the time, we can then calculate how, how far the object is. Um, in air, um, sound travels much slower, but if we use it underwater, it's actually very fast. And, and the same thing can be done underwater using a sonar device. Um, so what's an imaging sonar then? It really is the same sonar as, as the fish finder that I was just going through, but uh, it's often marketed like it's called, it's, it's ha it has video-like quality and sharp image. And, and oftentimes they're even called cameras because they make much sharper, much easier image for us to understand. The way it works is uh, they have narrower beams and more beams. So this one on the left is a single beam sonar. So again, there's only one ping of sound coming down. And then from this target, this fish, one ping will go back. While this one is a multi-beam, and so there is multiple of those similar beams next to each other. And all those narrow beams will give an echo back. So for example, the tail here will give earlier echo back before the head here. And that that's how the image is processed. And, and that, that's how, why we will see better image. Another way they work is they, they use higher frequencies, which means they can get give you much more detail, but that means also that the range will be shorter. So um, if we are mapping deep ocean, for example, we won't be able to use very high frequencies. And uh, way, way, way to remember, the way I remember this is, um, for example, if, if we have a rock concert somewhere far away, the one we hear far away is the, the bass drum. But when we walk into the, the room, we'll have the, the rock star screaming there and then we'll hear it all, which the, the screaming is way higher frequency. Um, imaging sonars are really not only used for fisheries. They're actually developed for other, other uses first. Um, often they're used for navigation, making bathrometric, bathrometric maps, and also finding mines that are uh, in, the, in, the, in the water. So, a mine and, and a fish are actually very similar targets when it comes for, to um, finding targets with the sonar. And that's a good thing because, um, for example, the sonar we are using was, was first used for this type of use. And then later on, someone realized that, hey, we can, we can start try and uh, find fish as well. There are a lot of different multi-beam sonars in the market. Um, the one we are using and the one really most of this type of fisheries work is um, Soundmetrics, Ares and Ditson. Um, so the Ares is a newer version of Ditson. 
I think still at this point, there are more papers, um, publications about Ditson sonar, but um, more and more people ha are using Aries sonars as well. But, but actually it is very much the same thing. Um, just a little bit more advanced as, as this Aries. Um, the way these two sonars work, uh, they use acoustic lens for forming the beams. Um, other multi-beam sonars can form their beams a little differently, but uh, that would be another webinar <laughs> to talk about. Um, so now um, we're going to have our first image of, of the Aries image. So here I have a rim river. Um, let's say it's it's floating this way from from up and down. If we put a sonar on this side of the river, it will be shooting across. And uh, what we see in this image is actually the river bottom. And uh, the more white, the brighter the image is, um, the, the, the higher, stronger the echo is. So for example, and in, in here, so there's the sonar here. Close to the sonar, it's it it's maybe a little bit deeper in this image. So the bottom isn't giving very strong echoes back yet. And then there are some bigger rocks here that are actually giving much, much more information for us. Um oh, so I'm just gonna change this. So we're we're actually looking at like a map from above. And uh, I'm just going to stop. There's going to be a fish coming right there. Ah. Right there. So what we get here is a fish. And uh, although the sonar itself is giving echoes from the side of the fish, from this side, it looks like we're looking at it from above. And what we also see here is this uh, shadow that's behind the fish. This is the shadow here, and this is the fish. Um, and there can be many fish. This is usually not the case in uh, in our uh, rivers or with, with Atlantic salmon. You, usually, most of the time, we we only have one one fish coming coming, or sometimes two fish. But not not it's not usual that we have this many fish at the same time in the image. Um, so how does it work? Again, the, the same picture that I had earlier, we have the multiple beams side by side. We can have one fish here and uh, we're getting the, the good image. We get, have two fish. Um, we can still get good echoes from both of these. Sometimes the shadow can make this fish to look um, not as bright, usually, because this one would be shadowing a little bit. But usually, we would see both of them. Um, so now, although we have many beams side by side this way, when we turn the uh, sonar other way, we actually only have a situation similar to a single beam sonar. This may not be easy to understand through, quickly through the webinar, but uh, this is like a 3D. I'll play it a couple of times, so maybe you'll see. So now we have these angry fish joining these two happy fish. And uh, now if you remember what I was showing from single beam sonars is that we can get a ping, an echo back from this fish, first happy fish. We can get an echo back from the second fish. But at this point, we're actually getting the, the same, the, the echo will be coming back at the same time from this angry fish and the happy fish. And that way, that's actually the reason we won't be able to see uh, three fish in the image, but but the image will actually look like this. So we'll only have two fish. Um, it will not usually be a problem. As I mentioned, we usually only have one, sometimes two fish uh, in our image with Atlantic salmon. But uh, for example, somewhere, some Pacific salmon stocks, there can be, this can be the, the case much more often, and, and oftentimes this whole beam can be full of fish, and that's something to 
keep keep in mind. Um, so right now we have some idea of what the data looks like. Um, I'm gonna go through some of the software and and what the software can do in order to for us to get the actual great results that we want. So um, the numbers and and the length of the fish. So this is a screenshot from uh, Aries fish, which comes with the uh, the sonar. When we buy an Aries sonar, we'll get this software. It's 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 a really good software um, for for doing this work. Um, so again, this is now a familiar image that we all have already seen the blue blue view. But what we can do with this software is to remove the background. So anything that wasn't moving in the in the video, we can just take it off. And all we have now is one single fish. That will make it make it much easier for us to to spot the fish that are moving and, and to count them. What we can also do with the software is zoom in and measure the fish. So for example, this one is 51.7 centimeters long fish. This is all we have to do by hand. So it takes some time to go through the data. Of course, if, if you have a lot of data. Um, so as I said, it's, it's a very good software for especially for smaller data sets if if you don't have to process a lot it's like a hammer a very good tool for what it's made for but then if if there is need to do more um there's also more software that can be used and this is like something um everybody knows we we know how to paint uh draw a picture with a with paint microsoft, microsoft paint it would be closer to that, but if you need to do something more advanced, you might want to take the Photoshop and do that. So really, this is a huge toolbox, which is, I, I, I wrote there, everything is possible, and, and I think everything really is possible. It just hasn't been figured out yet. So there's, there are a lot of tools, and uh, we just need more ideas how to process the sonar data. Um, so one, one way we want want to use and, and have started to to use other software is automate automation so of course as i mentioned the files are large we are for example monitoring 24 7 for for a couple months so there's a lot of data and uh my generation millennials we are not exactly known for um, w being willing to spend a lot of time repeating same job counting fish measuring them. So um, really, the automation is is the key that we think will help us maybe give us some time to do something else, maybe maybe focus on, on the research more. Um, so we're what we haven't used it yet. So actually, last summer, we were only doing everything manually, but uh, we're working on it to have software that automatically does the job for us. There are a couple of publications available about this type of work. As you see, it's, for example, there, it, it was more for Ditson, but it's the pretty much same ideas can be applied for, for Ares. Um, this is something that still has to be worked for each case. So whenever there is a new project, the same settings, the same automation will not necessarily work very easily in uh, in a new location, at least not yet. But here's an example how, how the automation works. So we have the fish here moving, swimming across, and then software finding the fish as it's going through. And and the, the really nice thing here is, of course, if I measure the fish manually, I don't want to do it more than one time because there are other fish to be measured as well. But um, this type of software can actually, we can measure it as many times as you want. And, and usually we could do it, for example, for each frame, which in this case could result in, let's say, 20 measurements. So now we get to uh, our study. 
So we are here. Google knows I'm in Fredericton. It also knows that there is Miramichi River north of New Brunswick. Um, we do, as I mentioned, do 24-7 recording. And uh, we start in May and go until November. That's you, ha, has been the plan, and, and we pretty much followed that uh, last last field season. And actually, 2017 was our first full field season uh, using these sonars in, in Miramichi. And uh, Miramichi itself is, there's a lot of different branches. And um, this one here is Northwest Miramichi River. That is Little Southwest and main southwest branch. And uh, we had one of our study sites in the Leo Southwest. Um, the the river looks looks like this. It's it's a beautiful place. And it's not very wide. So actually only one sonar is needed to cover the river most of the times. Of course, when there is a big flood, then we are and, and we're not able to, to really cover the whole river. But most of the summer, the water was very low, and, and just one beam could cover the whole whole width. And um, so this is, again, from above, how we cover the river. This is uh, a side profile, or profile profile of the river. So it's it's nicely, gradually going down, same way as the beam is, and, and the beam is covering all the way to the other side. Our other study site is in the main southwest branch in Blackville. It's a bit wider place, so we're actually using two sonars in there. Um, again, from above, one one on the other side shooting to the middle of the river, another one on the other side shooting to the middle of the river. And uh, the reason they're not exactly um, pointing against each other is that they would talk, start to talk to each other. So that would be a bad conversation for us because um, this guy would be sending sound to the other guy and uh, we would not be able to see much in our data anymore after that because that's not how they're designed to be. And here's again the, the, this, the profile. Um, similar situation to the uh, previous one, to the uh, Little Southwest, to the halfway, and then the other half is is going to be the opposite. And with these two sonars, we we can cover the whole river most of the time again. But when the water goes up, there's going to be more space. So if the sonar is here, um, there's going to be more space behind the sonars, and that's actually something we're we're working on to bit build a little fence in there to guide the fish more closer to the middle of the river and so that we would be we would see all of them in our image. Um, in Miramichi, unlike most um, of the, the, the salmon monitoring studies, we have a lot of different species that are actually similar in size as salmon. So um, we cannot just count fish itself and assume they're all salmon. And that is one of the biggest challenges, um, actually, in, in all of the sonar studies, not not just in our like uh, in, in when you're using airy sonars, but but any kind of sonar study. There is an we need another way to tell what species we have there, and and how many of each species we might have. So even even though we can just count the fish. As you remember, this is actually a fish here, but I wouldn't be able to tell the species from this image. So another method is needed. Um, we can either do, like as, as there is mentioned, we can either do, for example, trap netting to, to get ideas of when the fish are moving and uh, what 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 type of species we're having, but that would be something we'll we would have to do all the time throughout the the study. So 
we are hoping there would be something that we could also use with with the the sonar image itself that we could use at at least to some distance to be able to tell something about the species so length of course is a is a big thing that can always be used because most of those species that I, we have in Miramichi, for example, um, are going to be shorter uh, than salmon. So that that's one way to take some of the species out. Um, other other things we're looking into is the timing of migration. For example, um, maybe they maybe they mostly like salmon mostly migrate uh, at night, and other some other species throughout the day, or the timing of the year maybe some of them are schooling more often than than other species and then there is one that is super interesting is is that the um and Anne marie muller actually has has written this and and their team um about using tailbeat bat pattern so so how frequently the tail beats um and that can tell to some degree, um, what what species there there might be. Mm. So um, now we get to the how to start part. Um, as I said, you're probably not going to be starting a project soon, but I think this could be interesting. What we what we went through and uh, what we learned. So here is actually one one setup we had in the beginning. So it's just a computer in a box and a generator to give us power. So power is, it's probably the most important thing when we're starting a, an, an area study, because uh, without that, we the, the sonars and the laptops or the computers won't, will not work. Um, power, of course, um, generators work pretty well, but they need you need someone to to fill them all the time. Um, so of course it would be great if there is actual power line that you can connect into, which actually we have in in both of our study sites now. Um, then the river profile. Um, so this is the next step. If we have power, we have to make sure that uh, the sonars can actually work in 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 that place. So, for example, in this image, there's the profile here, and maybe if this is the max maximum distance that our sonar can go, we'll have this end here where the fish can swim without being detected with our sonar. So, we in this case, I would probably just move the sonar a little closer to the other shore and, and put, put the fence here to prevent the, the fish from swimming behind. But if there are big rocks, for example, they, they're a bigger problem because they're going to be making shadows behind them. And, and that is something that's not, not going to be solved easily. And then, yeah, fencing, as I mentioned. Actually, in this image, we have uh, Nathan and Chris building a fence. So that there is our sonar that's pointing across. And uh, this area here is the area I mentioned that behind the sonar. So any fish swimming behind here will not be detected. So that's where we're putting a fence here behind it. And now if we have a fish coming up upstream, it'll meet the fence first, and then we'll have to follow the fence and be guided to our image. That's going across in here. One thing to consider is the fish behavior. And, and the species of interest. So actually in this, this video here, um, this is just an example of what we probably don't wanna have if you're just willing to count fish that are going through. So here is this guy who uh, decides to pretty much just park in the, in the middle of the image and uh, it just decides to, to be there for, couple hours and and uh, of course now if we're looking at it with the eye we can have an idea that it, it has been there but uh, if it wasn't um, for example automate automation would again be a bit easier if there wasn't a lot of targets that are 
messing up what we're doing. Also, so actually this footage is, is from a pond, so the, the water is not moving anywhere. And uh, these, these fishes are, are just swimming wherever. And uh, now, again, like for example, if, if we wanted to count the fish that are going upstream, then we would have a lot of fish going downstream as well. And that's some behavior that we would probably want to avoid if we're counting the migrating Atlantic salmon. Not going to play this whole video because it'll take a couple hours. Um, and then internet um, is a really big thing. Um, after after this field season, I, I realized that um, we, can, we can easily operate without, but having it will solve a lot of problems because uh, if we can have an access to these computers, that means we don't actually have to drive there to check them all the time. And uh, we can check them more frequently because like one, one problem can be we go and check it and, and after an hour of our check, something happens. And if you only go there within the next 12 hours, for example, it'll be down for 11 hours of those. So having internet is, it just makes things much easier. You can eat a lunch and check that everything is fine and go and eat another lunch. Um, I'm going to go quickly through mounting because this is something we, we also spend a little time. Here's actually Ben, our technician in the summer. He's, he's holding the Aries, but he's not going to be holding that for, for a long time. So we need something else. Um, this is actually something they, they used in Alaska. This is a screenshot from uh, Soundmetrics website. Web website and uh, this is a really nice tripod. We didn't end up using that. We had a little lighter ver version that we can easily move to different places. Um, this is made of scaffolding. I know the, the guys in Finland also use similar setup. So here's the sonar and uh, it's attached to some kind of sc scaffolding, however uh, you want to build it. And then again, our, our technician Ben says, said one day that, okay, I'm going to build a, a better mound. And, and he did, he built actually a really, really good mound that um, now there is like a, like a gauge and uh, that protects our, our sonar much, even much better. And then um, we had our, our student, Daniel, he's, he's uh, way stronger than I am. So he actually pounded those big rebar in the, into the, the ground and, and we actually, the, the the mount was was very well secured to the bottom in even in the extreme conditions and uh, so yeah it they they survived the big flood but uh, it was also pretty difficult to try to get them out of water later but we did and we're gonna use them next year as well oh yeah what what's also needed so I wanted to point out a couple of things it's not just buying a, a sonar and and then putting in the water and hoping we'll have good 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 data and good numbers but we need data storage and and really um the data because it, it's videos and sonar data it is very it's huge so for one sonar we're getting 40 to 60 gigabytes every day um it, it depends on the settings. So um, if, 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 if you have very short range and, um, and, and a good quality image, it will be even higher. It can be a little less too, but especially if, if, if well, like in our case, we're getting 24 hours every day. Um, there, there is a lot of data. And if you want to save it, that is even more data. Um, another thing is the, the, analysis um it pretty much needs in order to keep up with the numbers every day it needs one one and a half two people per per one sonar unit um that of course includes the uh the maintenance uh, at the study site so um like going there and cleaning it and and things like that but this is something that uh, hopefully the the automation would make a little bit smaller because these two things are really like, it means we need a lot of money every year. 
a um, couple of issues I, I was going to go through. Um, power outages um, happen, so it's good to have a protector and, and battery pack up, back up there. The, having a battery backup actually saved us a couple of times because oftentimes the outages are short and they, the, with the backup it can run maybe a, an hour, sometimes even a couple hours. Um, internet, although it's 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 also a solution, but it can also be a little problem because oftentimes the internet is down and, and that can be a reason to go and, and check what's going on. Um, software issues, sometimes they do crash and um, they need cleaning. So this can happen. I'll collect a lot of stuff has to be clean. And then also, um, this is from, from Finland, actually. Um, Juha Lilia and, and other guys, they, they have pointed out that the lenses got covered with pollen. Um, and then user errors, whatever happens, usually they are linked to one of these. So maybe a software crash crashes, and then we don't realize that, and that, that takes some time. And that's why we're not collecting data all the time. Um, so it's only one, one part of, of a problem. Um, then also, if, if something happens to the hard, hardware, so the sonar itself, it's often expensive to fix. So, because these are not cheap, it's not cheap equipment. So um, we don't just have a spare sonar sitting and, and ready to go. But, but uh, um, if, if something breaks, we'll usually have to ship it to be fixed and that, that could take time. Um, that's just something to to remember. And now the uh, the, the the last part, um, the data and the results. Um, I'm going to start with some data from Finland, actually, because they have have been doing bits and work for for much longer. And I'm just going to open their website. Um, here. So they have put some really interesting data in here. There's also in English. Um, so everybody can go and, and have a look. But here are the numbers per, per day um, for, for a couple of years already. So for example, if you look at this year, it was much lower. So there was much less fish than in, in the previous years, especially compared to uh, for example, 2016, but but still, um, well, compared to our numbers, these are still pretty good good numbers, pretty good salmon runs in there. What we also see here, so um, this is the daily count, and in here below, um, it's going to oh, and uh, what we see here is most of the fish come early in, in, in the summer uh, and later on there'll be less fish coming up per day. And they actually have two different rivers. This other one, this uh, the first one is, is River Tornio, which is in this. Uh, mentioned in, in here, so it's, it's uh, it's a river that divides Sweden and Finland. So actually in this image, we're on, on Sweden side, looking to Finland that's on the other side. And they also use two sonars because the river is very wide. And those two sonars are not able to cover the whole river, but there is a section in the middle of the river that they are not uh, monitoring, but but they have tested and, and have, have seen that there, is, there are not many fish moving anyways. So they're not losing losing a lot of fish there. Um, another river is a little smaller. It's uh, River Simo. So here they also have similar looking data. And, and what's really cool with both of these rivers and, and the data they, they have here is that uh, um, I think they mentioned it somewhere, but they, they post these numbers approximately every week. So we, with, with this kind of data, we can, we can see how the numbers are developing over the, over the year. 
and let's say if, if our target was to have number of fish in the river before we can start fishing that could be a way to manage the the, the fishing season for example or if if they see during the season that we're actually not getting as many fish that could also be used for for management and maybe um, start the fishing season a little later so that's finland um Then our website is in here. We're reaching the, the hour soon, but uh, this is from our little Southwest Miramichi River, so the, the smaller smaller river. Um, what we have done with the data is, is we have two groups of uh, fish here. So the first one, this one here, is a, a krill size fish. So the fish that when well, only only spent one one winter in the in the sea before returning to the river, and uh, in this data we see like like in Finland actually um, a lot of fish <coughs> arrived in in June, and uh, there's less fish coming up in 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 the hot months actually, and then again as, as we reach October there are more krill sized fish coming up river. Um, we have in, in this graph we also post the the number of downstream moving fish so what this is is uh, uh as the salmon are migrating they're not only going, going up all the time but they might turn back and and looking for di different different spots and maybe sometimes just having fun or whatever they're doing um it can also be other species for example in in here um that can can be there is a some of those fish can be shad for example because they they would fit in that this si uh, size range and they would also return around that time um in this other graph we have plus 63 centimeter fish so fish that we measure and and are so big that this graph actually we shouldn't have too many other species than salmon and maybe some striped bass. And what's interesting with this graph compared to the, the first one is this this season, it was really dry and, and hot season here. Um, we had much fewer fish coming throughout the summer, but much more at the end of the season. So most of them stayed somewhere else before entering the river at the end of like, well, in October. One other way to, to what, what kind of data we're getting from these counts, it's, it's not only the daily count, but some interesting data is also what time they're migrating. So this is, for example, October from Maine Southwest uh, Miramichi River. Um, we see that the fish were most active at night. So maybe around 6 p.m. until 7, 8 in the morning, they were moving much more than from 9 a.m. to, to 5 p.m. <clears throat> uh, this is October, uh, but in November, when when uh, they have well started already spawning, most of them, uh, or even spawned already, there is not similar pattern. And also it's it's darker throughout the, the, the month. So we're pretty much, we've reached the, the hour. Um, I didn't, talk about my my PhD project or what I'm actually doing very much yet but uh, I just wanted to mention that these are the things I'm, I'm working with so um, uh, using the sonars and population estimates what really are the big three things are trying to figure out the accuracy working with the automation and the species and once these three are figured out we can then take the, the last step to the population estimates using these sonars. So um, if, if there is someone who's uh, interested in, in, in these these things, um, um, just shoot me email and, and I, I would like to talk more. Um, I, we, we, well, we'd like to thank all the partners and uh, would like to thank everybody for joining today. And uh, here's my email and 
I guess now it would be time for questions. So Tommy's also still here, if anyone has questions for Tommy. Um, yeah, thank you for listening. Thank you so much, Yanni and Tommy. Um, it's a really fascinating project and an excellent presentation. So as Yanni said, we're, we'll now open the, the session for the question and answer period. So if you haven't joined a webinar before, we have a couple of options for asking questions. Um, you can use your webinar control panel, which is the little gray box you should be seeing in the upper right hand corner of your screen. Um, that allows you to use the audio of your computer so you, so you can figuratively raise your hand, which is the yellow hand icon, and we can unmute you so you can ask a question directly. Or you can also type in your question um, right into the control panel and I will read it aloud for you. So we do already have one question that's come in um, and it relates to your second last slide. So wondering about um, digitizing and automating um, the sonar images um, in terms of measuring. Um, yes. Yeah. So maybe uh, if you wouldn't mind chatting just a little bit more about that. Uh, about which is this one or or which yes. one? Uh, yes. This one. Mm -hmm. um, so about the automation itself yes. or um, uh, what would be more precisely? Um, so uh, maybe I can find. Uh, so one of the, the question seems to relate directly to uh, fish measurements. So wondering oh, about measurement. automating. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. So um, oh, Tommy is going to show something. <laughs> um, well, yeah. Oh, so yeah. That's actually measuring itself is is pretty much um, the same as with doing it manually. We're trying to find a, a slide here. Um, Actually, I might, I was thinking of a different slide, but uh, this might be more, even even better for, 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 for this purpose. So um, I, I don't know if um, if the, uh, the, the person who asked the question was, was had turned this point yet, but uh, really because the, the sonar itself, um, we know the, the size of the beams and, 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 and the size of the pixels, um, that helps us to actually measure anything in, in in the image and uh this uh, yeah i'd say the the automation will be very similar to doing it manually so we'll just measure the, the size of the pixel um of course now if the fish is in an angle or, or or something like that it will give us a little bit different measurements so uh for example doing it automatically if we if we measure the fish multiple times we'll probably get very different um, measurement different lengths uh, for the fish at different different spots in the image, but uh, maybe using some some uh, average number of those will will give us the the best uh, length estimate. Maybe that was something that was helpful. <laughs> Yes, thank you. And and the person who asked the question, Robert Battis Jr., says that that was the correct slide. And thanks you for the for the answer. Okay. Yeah, and, and feel free to email me more if, or, or ask more uh, if something. Um, so our next question comes from Justin Wilson, who asks, um, "Do the fins use manual counting or automatic?" Uh, so the fins are still using manual counting at the moment. Um, but uh, they, I, I, I know they're also interested in, in uh, starting some automation in, in their studies. Great, thank you. Um, Sophie LeBlanc asks, uh, or says, thank you, Yanni, for the presentation. I was wondering if you've had any success in differentiating between striped bass and salmon. Yeah, thanks, thanks Sophie. Um, uh, not with this, uh, this year yet, but we have saved the data and uh, we actually have some very interesting data that we're going to be playing with in the, well, this winter and the coming year. So hopefully we'll have better ideas in the, in the, in the coming years to, to, that we can apply for, for the actual counts. Great. Thank you. Uh, Nathan Wilbur uh, writes, you showed good initial results from the Little Southwest. Do you have any um, 
from the Southwest. I'm thinking specifically in terms of run timing where there has been some speculation that a greater proportion of the run is coming in late in October, early November after the DFO trap nets are removed. Yeah, so um, we actually, uh, yeah, I was showing the little Southwest site. We we actually have data posted on, on the same website for the main Southwest. Um, we have only posted uh, the summer so far because um, we had so many other tasks in, in in the fall, so we couldn't keep up every day with kind of the numbers. But we're working on it, and and we're actually pretty close to having the whole season uh, wrapped up, and we'll be posting that online as soon as possible. Uh, in terms of when DFO removes the trap net, um, I think this year um, they were able to do one more week than they were planning on. So they they also got got. Uh, better data uh, for, from that time. We had uh, maybe one or two weeks more with with the sonars, but then we started getting ice and and we didn't want to take too many risks, so we took the sonars out. But that really is is one one good point that uh, the sonars we can more easily keep throughout November usually and uh, be able to get ideas of uh, are the fish still moving. Great, thank you. Uh, we have a quest question from Gregory Jador, and I am going to unmute his microphone. Gregory, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay, great. Okay, if you'd like to ask your question. Sure, I, I came in a little bit late, so I, I kind of missed the first starting of the uh, presentation. Uh, I was wondering, do you, do you have a video of uh, the sonars that is working within the streams and uh, how it works really good? Uh, so, because we're, we're, we're into, we have the uh, cages and we uh, do it manually here in Newfoundland. Oh, yeah. So I was just wondering, like, uh, do you have a video that's showing the, the, the sonars in uh, action? Uh, yeah, I, I think I had one. Um, I'm just going to have a look. This is actually not. Uh, in river, so so what 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 we see? I'm gonna play it, and I think you see it now. So, oh. yeah, yeah, I see. It. So so this is uh, an example of very good image, actually. So because it only goes from one meter to to six meters in distance, but uh, so I, I I must point out that as the rain, range range uh, grows, the the image will not be as sharp. But uh, oh. in here you can you can see the fish are moving. And there is a there is a shadow and 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 then and, and the fish itself. So here is the fish and and here is its shadow. Oh, okay. So in your words, would you say that the sonar is more accurate than the uh, the counting of the fences? Um, that that's uh, that, of of course it depends on the on the season. Uh, if you're actually talking about real like counting fence, um, and if if the conditions are good, uh, as for example, you don't have big floods or anything, then of course you can get really accurate count. But but the good thing with, with sonar is is you can even even when the water rises, we you can move it and uh, maybe use maybe add one more sonar for example, and then we can cover the whole river maybe more easily in in those extreme conditions. But I think fence is uh, is is it can well if if you can cover the whole river, you can. Get very accurate counts as well. Yeah, because I know in some of the rivers now, like uh, they have a early run and they have a late run. Uh, sometimes with DFO, they kind of put the uh, cages, the counting fencing at a certain point, but uh, some of the elders within the community say that there are earlier runs than that. Like they're saying the real bigger ones are going through first. Uh, probably yeah. a month or so even before the fences, counting fences do go up. And at the point, they try to keep it in there as uh, late as they can. But as you mentioned in the uh, fall of the year and the winter time, it gets kind of with the heist and a lot of debris. Yeah. Uh, so I'm wondering with the counting fences, are we missing the early runs and the later runs within the year? Yeah, that, that, can be, oh, of, of course, it depends um, on the river, and, and as you said, depends on wh wh when it started. But uh, um, with, with these sonars, yeah, it's much 
much easier to to put them early in, in the season and and also keep them longer because uh the flood and and water other stuff that's coming down the river will not have as big impact for for the sonars as it would be for for a fence or especially for for a trap net okay perfect that, that answers my questions thank you very much thank you all right, our next question comes from Donna Carroll, who uh, asks, ultimately, what is the best, best method for species identification at a fence using technology that you recommend? And she also comments that it was a sneaky little Waldo that was included in the presentation. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so so uh, the best method, method for species in, in the fence, um, um, trying um so does it mean uh, like in, in a counting fence or or using the sonar um maybe uh, if it's um if we had a, a fence next to uh the sonar we would have the the sonar numbers and then with the, the fence or or some kind of trap method we if we are able to catch fish all the time then we'll have um idea of how many of different species we, we were catching and then we can apply that number to our sonar counts would that be answer for the question <laughs> <laughs> well uh, i'll ask donna if she has a follow-up question please feel yeah. free to type it in um, the next question comes from tom rathby who asks uh do the fish counts from sonar correlate well with smolt wheel data what conclusions come from the agreement or disagreement um, so if, if, um, um, well, if, if we were to use sonar for, for counting smolts, I actually haven't seen much work with, with, uh, in regards to counting smolts, uh, using the sonar, um, or, um, so that's, that's some field to, to be explored more. Um, some, some difficulties would be seeing, uh, the, at that point, at that time, usually in the spring, there is more other debris floating down at the same time, and that can um, make be, be a problem for trying to identify the smolts from other stuff. Um, if if the question means for for the the small counts, and and after that, then as, as they're returning as adults, I actually don't know. Do you know? Is there data from Miramichi from smolts in the in the previous years, small numbers and how they correlate for returning adults. I, I do have a follow up comment. OK, from, from Tom Rathby. Uh, he says, I was thinking about the small counts as predictors of adults later. Yeah, yeah, OK. Yeah, um, yeah, that's so I don't think we have data at DFO's this. DFO's data has not been used that way. Yeah, DFO's data has not been used that way because uh, they probably would have better idea about that too, because um, so DFO also has trap nets in Miramichi for counting the adults. And uh, that could be one way to explore those data together. OK, thank you. Um, I have a question from Amanda Babin, uh, who asks, is the sonar a high enough resolution to get an echo from the swim bladder? Um, yes, yes and no. So um, that's actually a very we're very typically, um, especially with the lower frequency sonars, we it's actually the only thing that it's going to give us the echo. Uh, with the the sonar, the type of sonar we're using, um, we're, we're actually getting echo from from other parts of the the fish as well. Um, but uh, yeah, oftentimes the, the swing bladder will have will, will have an impact for the echo, but. Um, as as if you if, if we talk about the resolution, um, maybe it could be possible with, with a very short range, but maybe usually not very 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 uh, useful way to to use this sonars. I, I I say. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I think the last question that we've got today comes from Justin Wilson, who asks, when you have an ARIS device on either side of the river to ensure better coverage, do you assume that the fish detected from each device are different fish, or do you feel that you may count the same fish twice? 
Yeah, that's uh, in in um, Maine Southwest as we have those two sonars on, on both sides. Um, we at, with these numbers that we are posting on the website, we are now just assuming that we're counting different fish. But uh, of course, there are some cases when um, we are probably counting some of the fish a couple of times, or usually twice, because um, uh, if if they're, for example, swimming in an angle or they are also overlapping a little bit in the middle of the river but the thing is most mostly um the the fish fish stay closer to the shore and uh those we can assume that they are most of the time are just one fish and they're not going to be swimming through this yeah we can we can clean it up too but we, we haven't done it with the um the the data that we're posting but but that that is something another thing actually i'm going to be working with is to to have the best best way to clean that data up and and have an idea how the fish are actually act, acting and behaving and are, are they doing that is is that a big problem for us for example Thank you. And so I think that was our last question. So again, a big thank you to Yanni and to Tommy for today's presentation. Yeah, thanks.